Thank you for having me. I want to tell you how I became an advocate of peace, peace in general, and peace which would be served by an effective UN peace movement. I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee in the U.S. When I was 14 years old, I was carrying newspapers and I carried the extra on a Sunday morning which announced the invasion of Poland by Germany. When I was 16 years old, I was listening to the New York Philharmonic when they interrupted the program to say that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. By then, my elder brother was already in the Marines, serving on the USS Hornet, an aircraft carrier. By the time I was 17, my brother had been killed. The Hornet was the aircraft carrier that first bombed Tokyo, and the Japanese made sure that they sank it. He won a Navy Cross for bravery during that battle, but that didn't bring him back to life. At 18, I had to leave university, and I was in the infantry in the U.S. Army. I served in the infantry from the spring of 1944 to the end of 1945. I went overseas in the late fall of 1944 with the 63rd Infantry Division as a assistant gunner to a machine gun. My first gunner in the snow of Luxembourg got trench foot. So I became first gunner. That's how I got my only promotion. Shortly thereafter, we were moved to the SAR, and in February of 1945, we advanced across the SAR. For two or three days, we advanced, and then one day, we were walking down a road, and German fire opened up on us from a stone house at the corner of the road. This drove my machine gun squad into the forest on the right because the field on the left was open. As we went through the forest, we had to cross a path. In that path, we didn't know it, there were many mines. Three of us stepped on mines. I and one other stepped on what are called shoe mines. They blow off your foot. One of my ammunition carriers set off what's called a bouncing Betsy. A bouncing Betsy bounces up and then explodes at thigh level and it leads you to lose your whole leg. And so we were lucky. The advance continued and we were hauled out. But you will appreciate that by this time my view of war was not sanguine. I didn't think it was a great thing. So as I went back to the university, eventually I got a PhD at the University of Utah. But at that time, I had become a peace advocate. And being a peace advocate at that period in the 50, early 50s in the U.S. was not an occupation which appealed to the authorities. So by the time I finished my training, I could get no job in the U.S., but like many other lucky Americans, there was Canada. So I came to Canada for my first job in 1952. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that, was, that bell struck a very good note because I have been in Canada and a Canadian citizen for many years. And I would like to say that the, during the time I was on the boat coming back from Europe, President Roosevelt died. While I was in the hospital in Atlanta, Truman decided to drop a bomb on Hiroshima that killed 180,000 people, and then on Nagasaki that killed 80,000. And all these things have made me very sad about war. I was pleased that the UN came into being. I know that there were problems in its 
development. There are still problems. It's unfortunate that the UN is set up in such a way that one country can veto over 40 resolutions in the Security Council asking for justice for Palestinians. It's unfortunate that the, when the General Assembly votes 135 to 3 against sanctions against Cuba, that nothing happens. But to change the UN, to make it a more effective organ for peace, it is up to us as individuals to work for peace. We cannot expect miracles from the UN alone. We need to have people in the US, in Canada, and indeed throughout the world insist that the UN become an organ for peace, not a cover for a war in Iraq, but an organ for peace. And this is what I dream of for the UN in the future. Thank you.